objectivity doesn't exist. Whether or not people can pursue objectivity is its own question, but we all inherently experience life through our own perspectives. Speech, the people around us, photographs, video, recordings, all of it shapes who we are and how we see the world, transforming it into a canvas of our own design. The world is not only our oyster, but also a reflection of ourselves. It all sounds so romantic and opportunistic, and it can be for those lucky enough to be in its path. Only, its path is paved by those unlucky. The Moybridge clip, for example, a sequence of photographs that create the first moving image, sets the stage for a new industry founded in the old one's racism and discrimination. Its creator is installed into the legacy title, while the black jockey is lost to everyone. The tragedy of being forgotten is only felt when you can be forgotten in the first place. O.J. Haywood, raised to appease an industry designed against businesses like Haywood Hollywood Horses, took the weight of not only his father's business, but what his father represented when he passed. His great, great... Right. There's another great. Grandfather was the first animal wrangler and film star captured on film in the Moybridge clip, based on the actual first motion picture ever made. Despite how iconic the Haywood family is, OJ's father struggled in the industry, selling horses on the side and praying for films with sequels for job security. OJ is shook by his father's unexplainable death, but he also understands that he's the only one left to take on his business. OJ's sister, Emerald, is left confused but not dragged down by her father's death, advertising herself more than anything else when she tries to sell the business to a film set. Uh, and I'm Emerald Haywood. I direct, write, produce, act. I do a little singing on the side. They had completely opposite experiences with their father. OJ has worked with his father ever since he was a kid, while Emerald was never given the chance in the first place. She was supposed to train with a horse called Jean Jacket when she was nine, but OJ was given the opportunity instead. Pops never looked up at me. Exemplified by a look Emerald and OJ shared in a memory, OJ and Emerald were connected but separated by their father's ambitions. Unlike other films about siblings growing distant, the distance between them remains unsaid and unexplained throughout the entire movie, only suggested in subtle moments. They feel like actual siblings reconnecting. That's all you had to say then. The heavy weed. Siblings can drift apart or come together, and sometimes it can be affected by their parental relationships. Emerald is obviously drawn to her father's business as an icon in a mostly white Hollywood, shown by how she rewatches his old advertisements and looks at all the posters and iconography he garnered over the years. However, she doesn't seem to have had a personal relationship with him. She's most connected to OJ. OJ is a silent, gruff type, still using a flip phone and totally out of place in a modern VFX-driven film set. What his dad sold is not in the market anymore, driven out by an audience's need for grand spectacle. Without spectacle, What's so special about reality and realism? After an onset mishap with a VFX supervisor, OJ sees and tries to adapt, making his own DIY VFX ball to practice with his horses. M could not care less about this industry that so obviously neglects her family, showing up for OJ's sake and not the businesses. Even when mysterious forces endanger OJ and M's lives, he refuses to leave. He's worked too hard for this business and he'll feel like he failed his father if he leaves. OJ took on both the legend of Haywood and the burden of Hollywood. The look he gave M was one of trust and care, looking her in the eyes and letting her know that in the midst of her frustration with her father, he sees and understands her. He understands that she shouldn't take on this business, that her free spirit shouldn't be contained within its constraints. He wants to keep her out of it. To save as much of his estate as possible, one by one, OJ begins selling his horses to Jupe Park a child star turned amusement park host and reality TV star. Well, specifically, he was in Gordy's home. You sold Tina Pop's horses? I want to get him back. Can you stay out here? Jupe suspiciously avoids any and all suggestions of returning OJ's horses. But Jupe also lights up when people mention the show. It was super successful, he had his first crush on a co-star, and everyone loved Gordy, the titular chimp on set. Steven Yeun balances his interest, compelling him to vent his stories onto everyone around him alongside fettered PTSD that threatens the stability of his past. Without Gordy's home and the tragedy surrounding it, would anyone know Jupe's name, his career? Why is he worth watching to anyone? A balloon popped on set. Gordy was enraged. Gordy injured and killed people. Gordy was shot, 
His co-stars suffered violent, intense injuries, and their images haunt Jupe more than any of his wounds could. With such a systematic recount of events, the impact can never be fully felt. So, entertainment does what entertainment does best, broadcasting and monetizing the most shocking tragedies for the supposed benefit of the public, including an SNL skit Jupe vividly recalls. You haven't seen the Bad Gordy sketch on SNL? I mean, it pretty much nailed it better than I could. Everyone's trying to celebrate Gordy's birthday, but every time Gordy hears something about the jungle, Gordy, Catan, goes off. <laughs> and it's, it's Catan. He's just crushing it. He is a force of nature. He is killing on that stage. All this traumatic retelling becomes the job of a media spectacle like the skit, stripping Jupe of his agency and doing the remembering for him. It's all been appropriated for the benefit of the entertainment industry. And even the actor that's playing Jupe in the skit is Scott Wolf, a white actor, stripping down Jupe's trauma to be consumable for a discriminatory industry. The mediums of television and film have transformed Jupe's lifelong trauma into an immortal piece of pop culture. Though all entertainment, media, or images aren't really reality. The moment the camera captures reality on film or in real life, the image is merely a snapshot of reality. For a human to fully comprehend this though, images must be seen as images, not reality. In Chris Marker's documentary, San Solil, Hayao Yamaneko, inspired by Namjoon Pike's TV art, creates an effect he refers to as the zone. With news footage of riots in Japan, Yamaneko turns what could be perceived as objective images of riots into automatic artifice. He showed me the clashes of the 60s treated by his synthesizer. Pictures that are less deceptive, he says, with the conviction of a fanatic than those you see on television. At least they proclaim themselves to be what they are, images, not the portable and compact form of an already inaccessible reality. If news programs are able to program this artifice as a supposed fact, image producers and those behind the lens can craft their own versions of reality. This news footage was not only specifically shot, but it was specifically chosen and edited for programming as well. And so was all of the media and entertainment coverage of the Gordy's Home incident. Jupe's trauma has become a part of the pop culture ecosystem, a reality crafted for him to live in, supposedly profit from, and merchandising. Jupe can no longer remember for himself. His subjective reality has been undercut by the mainstream. It's snared by what he believes is an objective reality. Jupe becomes what the media wants from him a servant to spectacle like reality TV and amusement parks. So, Jupe plans to enact control over a spectacle of his own. Okay. Are you guys telling me that there's an alien spaceship in that fucking cloud right there? It doesn't move like a ship. What do you mean, OJ? What if it's not a ship? Outside the institutional conflicts of Nope, a mysterious entity preys on the Haywood Ranch and their horses. However, this entity was lured there by Jupe Park, who fed them OJ's horses to train it for some kind of show. And because of this, OJ and M's dad is killed by an object falling out of its mouth. Or at least, that is assumed to be its mouth. In reality, this thing the characters call a saucer, a UFO, or even the viewers, is modeled after classic UFO images that have dominated the realm of alien speculation. Through internalized knowledge of random History Channel documentaries like Ancient Aliens. Anyway, Ancient Aliens, History Channel, watch that shit. Or iconography created by celebrities like Jupe Park, this unknown being molds into what society already recognizes. Similarly to how items like Kodak film were specifically crafted for white or pale faces, what's presented in mainstream media becomes a precedent for how people will view the world around them. When OJ and M first encounter Jean Jacket, they discuss the concept of a bad miracle. What's a bad miracle? Hmm. You gotta work for that. A happening simultaneously unfathomable and deeply harmful. Events like natural disasters, car accidents, or even the Gordy's Home incident are examples of OJ's concept. However, the very idea of calling it a miracle hints at some kind of joy or surprise. If OJ and M can capture a bad miracle like Jean Jacket on tape, 
Maybe there could be some good to come out of all the confusion and suffering they've endured. The only problem is Jean Jacket cannot be caught on digital cameras, which are disabled by its EMP-like effect. With the help of Angel, an electronics customer service employee, OJ and M try every idea they have to get a single snapshot of this reality only they are aware of. Further investigating Jean Jacket's design, its body resembles not only images of UFOs, but also the human eye or a lens of a camera. This image is most recognizable when it's on its side chasing after OJ. This original goal to expose Jean Jacket and gain some kind of celebrity is ultimately exposing Jean Jacket with the similar properties of a lens. This beast that's tormented so many people, the brutal spectacle that keeps on giving, is a reflection of what the Haywoods have faced their entire life. Battling an industry dependent on the most depraved and empty spectacle, whether that be animals acting like humans or garishy effects, has left businesses like Haywoods financially barren and creatively ignored. OJ even calls the beast Jean Jacket just like M's first horse. As the manifestation of predatory control over film and image making, Jean Jacket is the reason for their father's death and their business's collapse. However, there is one person capable of capturing Jean Jacket on film. Antlers, a renowned cinematographer, has been searching for the impossible shot his entire life. He even initially neglects OJ and M's request to capture Jean Jacket on film. What is it? Reality. Oh no, reality. Completely uninterested in whatever reality on film could offer, Antlers only seeks to capture what others cannot. And if anyone was able to, it'd be the guy with non-electrical cameras. Later myself, no electricity. Didn't I tell you this motherfucker was gonna come up here with a non-electrical camera? Let's go, boy! Yeah! With their own cinematographer and their own lens, OJ and M may finally be able to flip a historically discriminatory lens for their own image and purpose. If true objectivity is a perpetuated facade, then this image may be the only way the Haywoods can expose the suffering no one else can see. But is there comfort in a subjective reality? Without the affirmation of others, or the acknowledgement of problematic institutions, what gives people a sense of truth when no one else believes it? I have never been able, really, to figure out <laughs> where my life begins and where it ends. In Jonas Mekas' As I Was Moving Ahead, Occasionally I Saw Brief Glimpses of Beauty, Mekas performed similar remembering to Chris Marker's Sansolil by using filmmaking and personal footage to recollect his past. Depending on the section, it could simply be people walking past him on the street or parenting his children. But it all relies on his personal perspective. So much so that the film experiments with time and space as Mekas delves deeper into his past. Because I really don't know where any piece of my life really belongs. What Mekas experienced throughout his life is now totally different to the life he's experienced on film. Ultimately, film becomes Mekas' palette for joyful and sorrowful expressions, but it isn't exactly grounded in objectivity or even reality. So, if OJ and M were to capture what they've experienced on film, it would become something totally different and inaccurate to what they've actually gone through. A single snapshot or a minute of footage won't fully capture Jean Jacket and what's done to the Haywoods. It extends even far before the death of their father, right when the story began. The Moybridge clip may have been the first set of moving images, but it created an industry of discrimination and bias that will stain Hollywood forever. But acknowledging individual biases and redirecting the camera's lens, particularly towards those ignored by it for centuries, can offer unheard and unseen peoples the mainstream lens. Cranking cameras of the past like Antler's camera to spotlight a history suppressed for too long. Whether it be photography, film, or any medium, people have the ability to override the bias of the lens, powering it outside the unreality of mainstream entertainment and media, hand-cranked IMAX style. In their final look, OJ lets M know that he'll always take this burden from her. Whether this burden be Jean Jacket or the burden of the Hollywood industry, OJ has always been there for her. But only when M exchanges the look back at him, does he understand that they now share this burden. That together, they're able to conquer all this discrimination, all of this loss, and finally kill the shallow, fetishistic parasite that sucked the life out of both of them. M ultimately kills Jean Jacket in the most shallow way possible by releasing a cartoon balloon version of Jupe as bait in a film all about the dangers of fetishized spectacle. Modern audiences are able to see two siblings pop Hollywood and media spectacle like a fucking balloon.
their family changed the industry and nothing can change that. Yes! Yes! Nobody fucks with A-Wood, bitch! Nobody! Damn it! A photograph of Jean Jacket lies on the ground, but M still chooses to look towards OJ. A jockey on a horse captured with iconic imagery reminiscent of westerns of the past. And finally, new audiences now know the jockey's name, O.J. Haywood. Oh.